I'm going to, rather than go chapter by chapter, because that would be an uncomfortable pace at which to try to address some of the remaining issues in the book. Actually, you'll discover if you skim through the remaining chapters that many of the topics we've already taken because the tabernacle is mentioned twice, in effect. It's detailed initially in several chapters where Moses is told what to do. And then it's recounted again in a different order with slightly different details when they actually construct it. So we really go through, if we were just going to go chapter by chapter, we'd actually go through the tabernacle twice. Once when it's initially presented to Moses, and then there's a little interlude, and then uh, when they actually build the tabernacle. And so that would be repetitious and I think unnecessary. What we've really tried to do is, I've tried to shift somewhat to go into a topical format, talking about the various furnishings and the rough structure and, and the coverings, which we discussed last time. That leaves a couple of things that... Uh, I think we've commented on before, but we might comment on just again. Uh, next up in our list was the outer court. I've described that to you to give you a broad picture of the tabernacle itself. But as you recall, the exterior, the first thing you notice is this um, contrivance that you and I would probably try to describe as a canvas fence. We have brass sockets posts and linen curtains that surround, that create a roughly 75 feet by 150 foot courtyard with one entrance to the east. And it, it's long axis running east and west with the entrance on the east. And this sort of uh, fence, slightly higher than eye level, is all that we really could see from the outside. And uh, we've mentioned that before. But there's a couple of things about that that probably I should mention. The tabernacle was located in the middle of the camp of Israel. The camp itself consisted of really 13 tribes. The tribe of Levi was in the center taking care of the tabernacle. So surrounding this tabernacle were really 12 tribes. And as you know, I think I've mentioned to you several times to help you get around some confusion if you're trying to wade through the scriptures on your own, you can get quickly confused because you keep hearing about the 12 tribes of Israel. And yet you discover there's always 12, whether you give or take one. In other words, if for the purposes of accounting the 12 tribes, you choose not to count the tribe of Levi, and that's frequently done because they were never go to war, so they were not counted in the order of march in that sense, and uh, several other purposes, the tribe of Levi is excluded, and yet you discover there's still 12 tribes, not counting Levi. If you, if you include the tribe of Levi, there's still 12 tribes. In the book of Revelation, we have a listing of the 12 tribes in which the tribe of Dan is not mentioned. And you sort of don't notice that unless you've been clued to look for it. But uh, you have 12 tribes listed, and yet the tribe of Dan is noticeable in its absence. You wonder, how can this be? Well, the answer, of course, is that the tribe of Joseph is split into two, Ephraim and Manasseh. Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes, adopted his two grandchildren. When he went to Egypt, Joseph had two children, Ephraim and Manasseh. Jacob adopted them as his own in a very important event that occurs near the end of the book of Genesis. So if you want to count 12 tribes, you can count the tribe of Joseph as one. He had the double portion, and they were ascribed to his two uh, children, Ephraim and Manasseh. If you want to count 12 excluding one of the other tribes, either Levi or Dan or what have you, then you simply count Ephraim and Manasseh as two tribes, and that's the way it's normally reckoned. But you should sort of recognize you're playing with an alphabet of 13, not 12, and all that sort of starts to uh, be a little more understandable. But in any case, getting back to our imaginary view of the camp of Israel, we had the, the tabernacle in the center, as I mentioned, and we have four camps described around that. To the north were three tribes making up a camp, to the west were three tribes making up a camp, to the south were three tribes, and to the east. The three tribes that, that uh, camped to the east would, would rally around the, the ensign of the tribe of Judah and were known collectively as the camp of Judah. The camp of Judah was not just the tribe of Judah, it was three tribes together in which Judah was the lead. And likewise for the other four sides. The, the standards for the four things were, as I think I've mentioned to you, a lion, an eagle, a man, and an ox. 
which are also the four faces of the cherubim, as described in each of the visions of the throne of God, whether it's in Isaiah 6 or Ezekiel 1 or Revelation 4. You notice there's always these peculiar creatures called cherubim, and they're always described with these four faces. And it's interesting to note that those same four faces were the four faces on the standards making up the four rallying points for the four camps making up the 12 tribes of Israel. Thus Israel, with the tabernacle in the center, probably unknowingly made up a model of the throne of God when she was encamped. Now, uh, I didn't want to get into all that again. I think we've had all that discussion, how those four faces represent the four Gospels, or at least in the minds of some scholars. And I think we've covered that in the past. If not, I'm sure they're in the notes and you can dig that out. But the one thing that you probably may not be sensitive to is that the camp of Israel was made of tents that were essentially made of goat's hair. And uh, the reason I mention that is something that's not obvious to you and I because it's not in our particular technology base, is that goat's hair makes up a very dark, almost black cloth. Scriptural evidence of this is in Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5, where, the, where it's mentioned it speaks of the tents of Israel as being black, as being black. So if you can, in your mind's eye, visualize the camp of Israel with these black tents, recognize that the tabernacle with this white linen fence stood out very brightly. Okay? Black represents, mediumatically, sin. And yet white represents righteousness. And as we look at the ta tabernacle from the outside, we see the white of righteousness, and it's sitting on what kind of sockets? Not silver this time. That was the tabernacle proper, the building. Brass. What does brass speak of? Judgment. Brass being the metal that with, can, can withstand fire. Fire speaking of judgment. Brass, therefore, Levit in the Levitical sense, speaks of judgment. So from the exterior, looking in, we see only the righteousness and judgment of God. That never attracts us. I don't think many of us have had a very successful witness going down the street and, and proclaiming cosmic judgment on the sinner. Somehow they don't really get too excited about that. Uh, what attracts us is always his grace and his love. But in any case, as we look at the white righteousness, there is, of course, one door. If we enter through that door, that door is whom? Jesus, Jesus Christ. We, of course, enter in. To the outer court, we have, of course, the laver, and we've been through that. I mean, the altar of sacrifice, and then the laver, and we've been through that. Okay. Now, a couple of other things we might take a look at. Let's just, for fun, uh, take a look at uh, some familiar passages. Psalm 65, 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest, who causes to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Notice the term courts is plural. There's more than one, right? Blessed is the man whom thou choosest, who thou causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. Uh, let's turn to Psalm 100, verse 4. Notice I'm, I'm staying strictly in the Old Testament here. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Right? And who is that addressed to? Look at the first verse. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come into his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God, it is he that who hath made us, and not we ourselves, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts. I want to point out to you that in the Old Testament, it had in view a very, very broad base of, of, uh, of fellowship. We could take the time, if we wanted to, to go to Leviticus 17.8, Leviticus 22.18, Numbers 15, verses 14 through 16, as other examples of Old Testament reference to the Gentile being saved. Um, but we might... Let's take one reference out of the New Testament. Let's turn to Romans 10 to see Paul's sanctified comment on the issue I've just raised. Let's start with verse 11. It's kind of a neat one. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now that may not mean it in the way you think. There's plenty of opportunity for you to witness in such a way that you can be ashamed. That's not what it means. Not ashamed in the sense of him letting you down. 
there's a there's no in, there's no command in the strip, uh, scripture, by the way, for us to go out and be obnoxious. That's really not what I was trying to get at. Some people seem to be called to that. I'm not referring to that at all. But verse 12, <laughs> for there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile or the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's quite a statement. That's quite a statement. Maybe many people in here that are troubled by, Rome, uh, by Hebrews 6 or 10 or some other particular misapplied scripture that believes they are outside the reach of the Lord. And that may sound funny to some of you, but probably all of us at one time or another in our lives will go through a stage, for whatever reason, uh, with having great doubt that we have somehow, by our backslidden condition, by our overt rebellion, by some issue or another, feel we're beyond the reach of his salvation. And I see that this seems to be an interesting thing to remember. The last verse of Hebrews 10, I mean Romans 10. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a pretty broad statement. And I commit that to your memory. Um, you might put that in your list of phone numbers. It's an important one. Um, now... Getting back to this outer court, the outer court thus is the, uh, it becomes, when, when, the, when the temporary nature of the tabernacle is replaced by the permanent nature, if I can use that term, of the temple, the, what, what this, this becomes, if you will, the outer court, sometimes called the court of the Gentiles. That strikes us with, with the, the great interest because of the interest we have in the first and te second temple. First temple is a term used of Solomon's temple. Second temple is the, refers to Herod's temple, originally built by Nehemiah and then remodeled by a non-Jew, Herod an Idumean, um, very elaborately. And being the temple, the so-called second temple, you and I might call it the third because we probably would see it as a successor to Nehemiah's, but that isn't the way the scholars tend to treat it. The second temple being the one that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ uh, presented himself in. There is a third temple that people are anticipating being built, and of course there's a fourth temple that Ezekiel describes, the so-called Millennial Temple. The, third, the building of the third temple, of course, would be very, very exciting because it's the next major step in having the, the um, uh, apparent plan of God unfold step by step. We've, done, we've seen almost everything else moved into place for the final big scene. Um, but among the scenarios that we look at as we examine what the scripture has to say about Europe and about uh, Israel's enemies and about uh, uh, all the different conditions, ecclesiastically, economically, politically, the scripture has much to say about that. And that's why we get interested in Daniel and Revelation. I won't cover all that here in the time we have. But as we get interested in all that and we look at the timelines, we recognize that perhaps the most obvious next step is for the temple to be rebuilt. Because in order for this world leader that we're all sort of intrigued with. In order for him to violate his treaty, he has to desecrate the temple. In order for him to desecrate the temple, it has to be not only built, but dedicated. And uh, so that seems to be the next step. And as I think I've shared with this group, there are some projects underway. Uh, you, if you're interested in this area, you'll discover the writings of, a, of a, a scholar by the name of Asher Kaufman, who published some papers publicly about, uh, about two years ago, I guess, in the Jerusalem Post and in the archaeological journals and so forth, which, uh, in which he documents substantial reason from texts and from sightings and other uh, arguments that the original site of the Second Temple and the First Temple are not where people have thought for the last 19 centuries, but rather a little bit to the north. The Dome of the Rock, presumably built over the original site, is built in an error that, in fact, the uh, original temple was apparently positioned, the temple proper, the Naus proper, um, corresponding to the tabernacle building itself, as opposed to the whole thing, is just enough to the north that it looks like, by some renderings, that the Dome of the Rock would actually could coexist. It would thus be in an undedicated portion, which was traditionally the court of the Gentiles. And that strikes us as fascinating because it's possible, we could, in our mind's eye, imagine a scenario where maybe a temple could be rebuilt on a coexistence basis with the Dome of the Rock, somehow being a a uh, compromise with the obvious conflicts that are pre present on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Um, it also strikes as fascinating when we contemplate Revelation 11 one, verses uh, 1 and 2, which seems to indicate that the temple that John sees in the Revelation period 
uh, does in fact uh, exclude the outer court for some peculiar profane reason. Uh, those of you that uh, understand what the Dome of the Rock is, it has an inscription on it in Arabic that God uh, it neither begots or is begotten, which is a denial of the deity of Jesus Christ, obviously. And is, is, uh, is, you know, some people find that uh, a little offensive. In any case, uh, the outer court will be in the news uh, if you watch the archaeological journals. Furthermore, there's a team of scientists that are looking at the possibility of using advanced technologies, ground penetrating radar, micro seismic sensors, microgravity meters, and uh, resistivity studies of the limestone in attempt to map the various corridors and chambers and what have you that lie below the temple floor. There are 36 cisterns and other all kinds of known passages, and we suspect there are many unknown or secret passages. It's even speculated by some scholars that in one of those chambers or passages deep down below the temple floor is probably a hidden chamber where the Ark of the Covenant would have been secreted before the temple was under attack by ba uh, Nebuchadnezzar in the days of Babylon where the Ark disappears. And um, so uh, it's all possible and interesting, and it turns out that today's technologies may allow that to be mapped three-dimensionally without actually having to go in and dig. Uh, how successful will depend on a thousand variables, including the dryness and the temperature and the success of access, and, and on it goes. And uh, if those projects do, in fact, continue, um, uh, we'll have a chance to, in fact, we'll have a chance this fall to review the progress of the summer. Let's put it that way. Okay, a couple of other things, just random comments about the outer court. You'll find many details, and I'm not going to try to enumerate the details. I'll give you just a few things to look at if you're interested in this sort of thing. Uh, it's interesting that the length of hangings for the linen that's described to make the fence are the same length, namely 280 cubits, of the hangings over the tabernacle. And uh, uh, some people think that might be very significant uh, uh, symbolically. The door, of course, which we talked about, is uh, 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 the entrance to the east. We've commented on before, but I think deserve comment again. If you look at John 10:9, Jesus Christ identifies himself as that door. It's interesting, just as one qualitative comment before we leave the outer court uh, as a topic, as we look at it, imagine yourself outside, you see this white righteousness, you see the suggested judgment of God that it rests upon. It's interesting, how would one, Levitically speaking, become saved? Well, the obviously is you have to enter through the door, right? Now. It's interesting that you can't just think about the door. You can't just read about the door. Uh, you can't just believe that if you went through the door, everything would be neat. You've got to do a very remarkable thing. You've got to enter the, through the door. And uh, I might leave you with that one idea. There's many people in this room that probably find it a lot of fun to read about Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people in this room that like that probably believe that Jesus Christ was indeed the Son of God, and uh, give intellectual assent that that's very likely to be possible. Um, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about entering in, partaking of, committing oneself to. That's what it's all about. So there is a transition between simply the intellectual assent and the commitment we're talking about, and I'll leave you to wrestle with that either this evening or over the summer or over the next 10 years or whatever you think you can spare. Um, the, uh, it, it does remind me, though, of a conversation I had at work some time ago with someone who was suggesting that the Bible was nonsense. Certainly no enlightened technical, enlightened person could accept all of this. And I couldn't resist the response being that that particular party had a lot more guts than I did. He looked at me rather startled, because I'm known in that particular community as a gutsy, risk-taking kind of guy. And I... Um, said, I don't have those kind of guts. To bet my entire eternity that the Bible is wrong, that guy has a lot more guts than I have. Some of you in the room probably are in that position. It's fun, it's interesting, uh, uh, you know. But uh, failing to commit to Jesus Christ is a form of rejection. And that's an issue that I think he would have you confronted with this evening, over the coming week, maybe to wrestle with over the summer as you change your personal routine and go to the mountains or the beach or the whatever, it would be my prayer that he give you no peace until you rest in him. And whether it takes uh, 
uh, a face-to-face -face confrontation with him tonight before you retire by, in your bed, or whether it takes some cute scripture-quoting chick you meet on the beach uh, during the month of July, <laughs> or whether it takes a hair-raising, life-challenging confrontation of some other description, uh, I, I think the Lord knows how to get your attention. Uh, I pray that he does and that you, as a result of hopefully some increase in appetite by the previous Monday nights we spent together, um, succeed in the resolve and the commitment to, to accept him at his word. But let's move on. Uh, another major chunk of, uh, of the book of Exodus deals now with uh, the priestly garments. And uh, it's not my intention to get into that in detail, because there's a lot of stuff there. I'll just make a few random observations. It's interesting to note that the way the book of Exodus is organized, the dis introduction and the description of the priestly garments are treated as part of the tabernacle. Now, that's kind of strange when you think about it. We don't, we're not surprised to find that in the book of Leviticus, which has all the ordinances and details, and it's a, you know, it's a, a handbook for the, for the priest. But as we go through the book of Exodus and we have the description of this building and these furnishings, we discover that the priests are described almost as if they're part of the furnishings. They are described as part of the tabernacle. And that should be a signal, a sort of an emphasis, that the priests and their garments are also, also point to whom? Jesus Christ. You betcha. Now, a couple of little interesting things. Um, when we study the um, book of Revelation, we're fascinated to see the 24 elders, right? And there are many theories on who the 24 elders are, and I won't revisit all those tonight. But if we take a concordance or we try to study the scripture, we discover, now many people glibly say, well, there's 12 apostles and 12 tribes, and that's, that's reasonable, but nowhere are they really 24 together, per se. But if we look through the scripture, where do we find the number 24. There's only one place that I know of. When David organized the priesthood, administratively, it got large. They ended up, I think it was under David, if I recall correctly. He, uh, I didn't get those notes in front of me. But basically, they were organized into 24 courses. Courses. And if you're sensitive as you read the scripture, you'll discover from time to time so-and-so was of the course of such-and-such. Such. A course was one of 24 groups of priests. You were born into the priesthood. You served under a course. It was sort of like a, shift, like a watch bill or a shift. And at the temple, one particular course would have the duty for a particular period, and then they'd be replaced by the next one. Certain holidays, for example, the Feast of Tabernacles, was unique in that all 24 courses were present. I think that may be also true of the Feast of Passover. I'd have to consult my notes to be sure, but I think there's only no more than three, one for sure, where all 24 courses were uniquely present for that uh, celebration. And uh, so there are these courses. Now, what's interesting, from that background, you don't find the number 24 here, but I found out something kind of interesting. It's the kind of tidbit that interests screwballs like me, it may have no spiritual value at all. You'll see as you read the book of Exodus, relative to the priesthood, that Aaron and his sons are mentioned. Aaron and his sons. Aaron and his sons. As a way of referencing the priesthood, right? How many times are they mentioned? 24 in the book of Exodus. Now, that doesn't prove anything. It doesn't. But I find it fascinating because if there is validity to the concept that there's a, a conceptual link between the priesthood and the 24, I think it's fascinating that the Holy Spirit is that consistent that even before that idea is introduced, because the 24 gets introduced by David many, many years later, and doesn't really show up visibly as an emblem until the book of Revelation, chapter 4 and 5. And yet, in the structure of the book of Exodus that lays the groundwork for all of this, how many times do they mention? 24. I think that's interesting. I think that's fascinating. I see the fingerprint of the Holy Spirit in the, in the, in the text. Priesthood refers to fellowship. Um, and if you're really interested in this, and I think you should be, you can find no more eloquent, no more thorough commentary than the book of Hebrews. The writer of the book of Hebrews takes on himself the burden of describing what the priesthood is really all about and how Jesus Christ 
is preeminent in that model. He, in fact, goes beyond the Aaronic priesthood altogether and speaks to even a higher priesthood, the priesthood of Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek had something unique about him, several things that the writer Hebrews emphasizes, but the main one being that he was also a king and a priest. The Aaronic priesthood under Aaron and his sons were never, never ruled. They were of the tribe of Levi. The royal tribe was the tribe of Judah. God separates the priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, sometimes called the Levitical priesthood, and the kingship all the way through the scripture. Very, very critical issue all the way through. And we speak, the writer of the book of Hebrews speaks of Jesus Christ as your high priest, but after the order of Melchizedek for a couple of reasons. He predates Abraham in the first place. Abraham himself gave offerings to Melchizedek. And therefore, in fact, the writer of Hebrews uses the argument that conceptually, in a rabbinical sense, where was Moses and Aaron then? They were in the loins yet of Abraham. So if Abraham is offering tithes to Melchizedek, by inference then, in a rabbinical sense, Moses and Aaron are subservient. They're certainly subservient to Abraham, who is subservient to Melchizedek. So therefore, the priesthood of Melchizedek is a higher order than the priesthood of Levi. That's The writer in Hebrews is using the kind of logic that would seem appropriate to a rabbi. That may seem, you and I, that may seem strange kind of reasoning, but that's what he's doing. But anyway, he'll deal with all that. And if you're interested this summer in digging my priesthood, you can find no better approach than to dig in the book of Hebrews. There is one topic that I... Um, will share with you the ignorance that generally prevails about, but without necessarily illuminating a much, much more effective. In, in chapter 28, we have an interesting thing called the breastplate. In describing the garments of the high priest, there are many things described in the interest of time. We won't try to take them all, but there is a little excursion that I will um, uh, suggest to you, it used to fascinate me intensely 20 years ago. And for a while, I chased references to try to get some real background here. And I can tell you, frankly, that the things I've stumbled into over the last 20 years, or whatever it's been, maybe 30, I hate to admit that, uh, I guess it is, um, really aren't very competent. There is a lot of mystery about what I'm going to propose. So I'm going to take you to a few things to sort of intrigue you with the idea. And if any of you encounter something you think is competent, I would uh, consider it a, a, a real gift or help or whatever to put me onto it. But um, basically, the breastplate of the high priest consisted of precious stones, that uh, four rows of three each. One of them is an onyx, first mentioned in Genesis chapter 2, fine. But what makes these stones interesting is that there are 12 of them. If in Genesis, I mean in Exodus 28, um, say, let's pick it up about um, verse 17, thou shalt set it in settings of stone, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, a carbuncle. This will be the first row. Second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. Third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. Notice it starts with the sardius, ends with the jasper. In the book of Revelation, those two stones are mentioned, but backwards. Some people say it's on either side of the cross. One, there's all kinds of theories as to why they're expressed that way. The stone shall be with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, um, like the engravings of a signet. Every one with his name shall be according to the 12 tribes, and on he goes. Now, these 12, these 12 precious stones in the breastplate, obviously, as it expressly says, refers to the 12 tribes of Israel, at least. It may refer to more. To make this a little, a little clearer, let's turn to Revelation chapter 21. Chapter 21 opens up, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea, and then we see the new Jerusalem, which is a large subject we won't try to even tackle tonight, but let's pick it up about verse... 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden rod or reed to measure the city and the gates of it and its wall. Now we come down here, uh, and he measured 144 cubits. So verse 18, the building of the wall, it was of jasper, and the city was of pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. 
And then the Holy Spirit finds it needful to identify the twelve. The first foundation was Jasper, the second Sapphire, the third Chalcedony, the fourth Emerald, the fifth Sardonyx, the sixth Sardius, the seventh Chrysolite, the eighth Beryl, the ninth Topaz, the tenth Chrysoprasus, I guess, and the eleventh Jacinth, and the twelfth Amethyst. Now, your first attempt to say, gee, those are twelve stones. You can't help but feel instinctively that there's a relationship between those 12 stones in the book of Revelation and the 12 stones of the high priest in Exodus. Except there's a couple of problems. The Hebrew in this is all translated. And you'll notice they're in a strange order. They play around with the order and it doesn't really fit. And one reason it doesn't is we're not sure from the Hebrew in Exodus as to what those stones were. The translation of one word to a particular stone is at least in part an inference on the part of the translators. In the New Testament text, it is translated from the Greek. And it turns out, when you dig into this a little bit, there is some ambiguity as to which precious stones were meant by which word in the originals. And there's even further confusion thus as to which it should be translated into relative to the various uses of these various words. The, the field of semi-precious stones, as we would call it, is a field that has many different words throughout the centuries for their different gems. And so it turns out that some of the things I've seen turn out to not be characterized by very deep scholarship. And I have seen some scholarly works that attempt to dig into this with some frustration as to trying to map one against the other. It's very confusing, very ambiguous. Um, so I mention that to you because it's an area, there may be a study that's quite competent and thorough. I haven't found it, and I would be very interested in that for a couple of reasons. First of all, I tend to suspect there's perhaps very deep significance in, the, in those stones and the relationship as used throughout the Scripture. Let me give you an example of that. Um, we have, of course, an image of Eden. We we, when, I, when I talk about the Garden of Eden, you and I draw our images from Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3, right? We tend to vision, if we were, and we're also victims probably of many of the artistic renderings of that passage, which typically are tropical. We visualize foliage and leaves and certainly fig leaves, and um, uh, whatever, right? And we picture Eden in a botanical mentality, right? Now, there is another description of Eden that's a very strange one. Turn with me, if you will, to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel. Did you know that Ezekiel talked about Eden? A uh, very surprising passage. Ezekiel has a passage... Just as Isaiah has a passage which addresses Lucifer, in Isaiah, he's uh, talking about the, he's talking to the king of Babylon, but then in his passage goes far beyond the real king and goes to the power behind the king, namely Satan. And in Isaiah 14, we have an, a great deal of information about the origin of Lucifer and Satan and what have you. A similar thing occurs in Ezekiel 28. You can always remember the two passages because it's Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. It's an easy, both multiples of seven by just accident. Um, no, they are because the chapter divisions were uh, applied. You know, I, I was very fascinated. I think some of you may have seen some of these passages, uh, uh, the letters from Herod's wife and uh, what was this other book that came out? Um, Anyway, it was uh, purported documents of the time of Christ translated. But they make reference to Isaiah 6 and uh, uh, this, that, and the other thing. And it's very, you know, you wonder, are they real or not? Well, it's very interesting that they could refer to Isaiah 6 because the chapter divisions were added in the 15th century. And so you sort of wonder how, you know, Caesar's wife got so clever. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, no, chapter divisions are, are partitions that are made by man. And, in fact, frequently you discover that there are some unfortunate breaks because sometimes a chapter should start a verse earlier or later or whatever. So the, while they're sometimes useful to draw little, analysis, uh, little an analogies to remember them, I wouldn't place too much scriptural significance on the number of verses in a chapter, the number of chapters in a book. They're, they're really rather arbitrary. Um, 
Where they are significant, it's probably because the text structure itself is visible enough that the chapter divisions fell properly. But in any case, uh, in, in Ezekiel 28, we have such a passage where the, the, what the, it's an address to the king of Tyre that gives rise to a passage aimed far beyond the king of Tyre. Uh, let's uh, pick it up about uh, verse 12. Son of man, title that uh, Ezekiel uses of himself, or the Lord uses of him. Take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Slight unfortunate translation. What it really means is thou, thou, you are the ultimate consummation of all wisdom and beauty. Now, that's a strange thing for God to say of the king of Tyre. It turns out he's saying it to the king of Tyre, but his real addressee it goes far beyond that. And you'll see quickly, by the way, because the next line, verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden. Now, there's no way the king of Tyre was, was in Eden. You know, that, that, that uh, caste was a relatively constrained group of people. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. Nine of them. The workmanship of thy timbrels and of thy flutes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. In other words, he was a fantastic musician. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Anointed means, you know, appointed. Anointed, in other words, to rule or to preside, whatever. That covereth, meaning at the head. The covering, it's like an org chart, the one that's at the top. He's numero uno. He is the cherub that was appointed to govern. The whole shebang. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. The word fire and light are equivalent. We're going to see Urim and Thurmim in a minute, which means lights and perfections. Fire and light are almost synonyms. And incidentally, one possibility that has been suggested is that precious stones are probably the easiest way to try to model light. If I was trying to describe to an ancient color, uh, uh, culture someone clothed with light, how would I do that? Now, you and I are beneficiaries of all kinds of Hollywood special effects. We have our imaginations are extremely stretched because of the creativity in our, in our visual media. So we can th see things like uh, Close Encounters and some of these kinds of movies where they've been very imaginative in, in creating special effects. So for us to consider, visualize a city of light or a being clothed with light, we have the capacity to relate to that. But I imagine someone three, 4,000 years ago might have a little more difficulty. You know? And so it's possible this is an idiom that the Holy Spirit's using to describe that. You were clothed, every precious stone was thy covering. And what that may be a way of saying, he was clothed with light. This is one of several passages that cause us to suspect that Adam and Eve were clothed with light when they were pure, immortal. And it was uh, uh, their, their fall, their sin, and their subsequent, you know, the resulting fall that caused them to lose that capability that caused them to realize they were naked. It wasn't a sexual kind of nakedness. It was a change of state. They no longer enjoyed the mobility in this hyperspace they were involved in before they were restricted into a special situation. As a mathematician would say, we've gone from the general case to a special case. And that may be what caused them to realize they needed some kind of covering. It isn't a, a, a puritanical, ethical interpretation I'm dealing with. It's a it's a hyperspace situation that I'm suggesting. Anyway, I don't have a great deal to offer you other than to connect in your mind Exodus 28, Ezekiel 28, and Revelation 21. And if there's a link there, and I believe there is, at the same time I have found suspect some of the simple little charts that try to relate the King James English translations of those stones because it turns out there's enormous ambiguity as to which stone in the original Greek and which stone in the original Hebrew relate to one another because of just the evolutionary uh, nature of the gem field. Now, there is another thing that uh, probably deserves uh, 
my sharing an equivalent level of ignorance on. Uh, but before I do that, I will take refuge in a couple of scriptures. You might turn with me to Deuteronomy 29, 29. This is a defensive maneuver uh, to cover my state of ignorance of the next topic. I will cover myself with two, two passages. One is Deuteronomy 29, 29. Whenever somebody asks you a question of some deep mystical significance that you don't know the answer to, in a, put on your most smug scholastic glower and quote Deuteronomy 29, 29. And if that doesn't do it, the person, of course, is hopeless. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. And a comparable passage is, is Psalm 1913, um, which uh, is essentially uh, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. I should really write that on my mirror at home to uh, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Now, um, then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Now, and I do, I'm being a little flippant here, but there is a, there's a very gray area. There's an area in which it's interesting and I believe can be constructive to sort of speculate and explore and, and uh, explore cautiously. And uh, there are many of those places that we have had a tendency to touch upon and it's also been my style to be a little speculative, a little loose with a sophisticated group. But there are also areas in which um, one needs to exercise great caution, in which if the Lord wanted us to know, he probably would have told us more. That's a dangerous logic, too, because that's also an easy cop-out from doing some really diligent digging. And I'm, the area I'm about to suggest, I'm not suggesting you not do all you can to dig and see if you can discover the mystery of the Urim and Thummim, or however you pronounce it. It turns out that uh, in the description in Exodus 28, we have introduced, without much comment, in verse um, 30, one little verse in the book of Exodus starts the whole debate. He's talking about the high priest, and he says in verse 30, And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart. And when he goeth in before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Now, how many times do you think the Urim and the Thummim are mentioned in the scripture, cover to cover? Seven, I heard. That's always your safe guess. You know, uh, the probabilities are even better than in Las Vegas that that's the answer. Now, um, it turns out, those of you that are listening to the tape or care to chase these things down, in Exodus 28.30, Leviticus 8.8, 8, Ezekiel 2.63, and Nehemiah 7.65, these two things, the Urim and the Thummim, are mentioned together. In Deuteronomy 33.8, they're mentioned but in the opposite order, the Thummim and the Urim, which I'm not suggesting is significant. I'm just showing you the depth of the research we go to to support these Monday night studies. Um, in Numbers 27.21 and 1 Samuel um, uh, 25.6, or is it 28.6? I can't read my writing. Anyway, uh, the Urim is mentioned alone. One can argue that maybe they are implied to be together, but it, it happens to be mentioned alone. In any case, if you add that up, that's seven times. And if you go through each of those passages, you'll discover that what these things are, these two things, whatever they are, are some method of casting lots. Apparently, now we're going to now start to indulge in some inferences. They're reasonably safe inferences, more you know, on large measure. From the passages, we can conclude that the high priest engaged in some procedure to either break a tie or cause a decision as from the Lord. The analogy would be like casting lots, like uh, drawing straws, but trying to do it in such a way that the Lord clearly determines the outcome. Now exactly, now that we're pretty comfortable, that so far 
that I think is generally accepted among scholars that the Urim and the Thummim, whatever they really were, was some priestly procedure to pass judgment on some issue. Exactly what form they took is a subject of all kinds of scholastic debate. Now, we know that the two words are plural. Thummim and uh, Urim are plural forms of the Hebrew word, but it could be a majestic plural. See, it's possible for a singular item to be spoken of in the plural, to give it, that's, that's, a, a, that's a rhetorical way of giving something emphasis or majesty. The word urim actually means lights or fire. Thummim means perfections. This is typically translated lights and perfections. What might be more closer to the significance of these might be manifestations and truth. Manifestations and truth. Now, there's another aspect to these that is suggestive here, and that is that these nowhere is there any evidence that they were made. It says here, thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim. Now the breastplate was twelve stones. What apparently these things, what most what many scholars believe they are, were a couple of stones, maybe of two colors, maybe black and white or what have you, in a little bag. And this little bag was kept in the back of the breastplate of the high priest. So they were over his heart, as the scripture describes. And when you came to me as the priest and you asked me some really tough question or some issue had to be decided, what shall I say, arbitrarily or randomly, for which there wasn't clear scripture or law, what I might do is reach in the little bag and, you know, heads I win and tails you lose. You know, one of those kinds of things. And, and I would grab, I would reach in there and pull out one of the two stones, presumably exactly the same size, weight, and feel. And that might be the way I would, so to speak, cast lots. A procedure that might be culturally analogous to us flipping a coin. Okay? That's the way it seems to be used throughout the seven passages of Scripture. Now... That's really, uh, on the one hand, I want you aware of what they are because you'll come across them from time to time. And if you don't understand what they are, feel that you, you can feel that you are no less informed than most scholars because most scholars don't really know what they are either. A few presumptuous ones talk as if they did. But I think it's widely acknowledged, to the best of my knowledge, there really isn't any really sound development of what they were physically. Their function we seem to understand. We can guess reasonably as to what they consisted of. There are many alternative renderings that are more fanciful that I'll skip. The one thing you can do, though, in, in a manner consistent with the rest of our, our uh, theme in Exodus, is you yourself can take those, the, the Urim and the Thummim, and, and I can, with reasonable safety, not knowing what they were physically, suggest that who do they point to? Jesus Christ. Who is our light? Who is our perfection? Who is our manifestation and our truth? Who is the perfect judge? Who is the one that should be our guide? And you know, you can, you can build from this very quickly the an analogy for us as the Christian believer that the book of Exodus lays the groundwork for. We could, of course, travel through all the ecclesiastical, Levitical detail between here and the end of the book, and, and it could be quite tedious. I, I, I think you will... Uh, I see a lot of nods in, in, in agreement. There is, though, a change of pace for two chapters in the book before it gets back into this kind of thing. And I think it's probably worth uh, uh, taking a break, so to speak, and digging into chapter 32. Because in some respects, uh, uh, incidentally, in the meantime, we talked about uh, who can worship and so forth. The Sabbath is reintroduced and so forth. Okay. And... Um, we might catch verse 18 of the last, the last verse of chapter 31, where it says, And he gave to Moses, when he had ceased speaking with him upon the Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Right? Okay. Now we get to chapter 32, which by many accounts is the most remarkable chapter in the book of Exodus. And, and, and that's the one thing that uh, the movie the DeMille production, 56 production of, of, of Ten Commandments, did get across, I think. I saw many unbelieving people react to this movie very constructively because here they are, they're in bondage, slavery, 
you had a sense of the world empire of Egypt and its power and its dominance. And here this uh, exiled guy gets called back, ordained by the Lord to redeem his people. And he comes back and after an incredible series of confrontations that were deliberately staged by God to be dramatic and to have a showdown, uh, of course, uh, we have the death of the firstborn. We have all these incredible things, water turned to blood and all these different plagues and, and the death of the firstborn hit cattle and dogs and people and whatever firstborn. And uh, that shakes them up enough so they get their freedom and then they go and Pharaoh re regrets the whole thing and sends his armies after them. And we have this incredible crossing of the Red Sea. I happen to be one of those people that's very strongly convinced that DeMille did very little exaggeration as to, in terms of his visualization of what uh, that event was, uh, was like. All these screwball accounts that uh, uh, say the crossing of the Red Sea was, you know, shallow water uh, is, is pretty funny to drown the Egyptian army in shallow water. Anyway, uh, the point is that here they are, the waters part, they go across, and the waters close on their enemies. You, know, you, it, you have to sort of have that in your grasp it's hard for us to imagine how a people that were the participants, or shall I say spectators, of these incredible displays of cosmic intervention in their lives. The minute Moses splits the scene for a little bit and goes up in the hill, what do they do? They make a golden calf. And I've had many people that were really, really not believers, they just saw the movie or, or saw it on television or one of the reruns, come away with sort of a, you know, typically like denominational Christians are sort of half into it. They sort of say, gee, how could those people, after having all that dramatized uh, so vividly, not be totally irrevocably committed? And... Uh, uh, we'll come back to that. Let's look at chapter 32 and see what they do. <laughs> and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what has become of him. Sort of missed the point, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, Moses wasn't the guy that parted the Red Sea. That's probably important for us all to remember, by the way. Just make sure who we're keeping our eye on. But in any case, verse 2. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, and of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, fashioned it with an engraving tool after he had made it a melted calf. And he said, These are thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow, guess what? What is tomorrow? Get this. Listen to this carefully. Tomorrow's a feast of the golden calf. Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. That's interesting. Feasts have not been ordained yet, by the way. They come later. They rose up early on the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. Can you imagine? And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. <laughs> Remember Charlton Heston was interviewed once. Uh, when he was making the movie, apparently. And he says, it's funny when you get into a role how you can take yourself very, very seriously. And they apparently were doing a shooting scene of this big orgy thing down there. And he was coming down the, and they took a break. And just as they broke for the scene, as they were going back to the dressing room, one of the girls said, out, party pooper, you know, in terms of causing this whole, this whole scene. But uh, anyway, um, you know, you and I could visualize these people um, backsliding in the sense of failing to follow an ordinance. We could visualize them not observing some particular routine, you know, playing golf on Sunday or something. But what we have here, and we need to emphasize, is an overt, aggressive, offensive, and intent to offend 
You don't generally, you know, you can understand someone wanting to sleep in on Sunday morning, using an analogy, or playing golf on Sunday, giving in to some other desire, you know. That doesn't excuse it, but you can sort of understand that. It's hard for us to grasp the idea that what they were really doing was giving of themselves in rebellion. In rebellion. And um, it was only five months earlier that uh, Moses and the children in chapter 15 sang the song to the Lord and said, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider hath he th thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him and habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him, and so forth. Five months later, what are they doing? Building a golden calf. Well, on it goes. You know the story. Uh, the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for thy people. It doesn't say my people here. It's thy people. You know, you girls know that. You know, when the kid misbehaves, the husband says, It's your child that's getting into the garden, right? <laughs> Lord said unto Moses, Get thee down, for thy people whom thou broughtest out of the land of G Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made a melted calf and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These are thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee out of, out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath burn against thy people, whom thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Moses was Jewish, wasn't he? That's interesting. <laughs> Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did they bring them out and slay them in the mountains, to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Isn't that interesting? Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou didst swear by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, that they will inherit it forever. And did the defense counsel win? Yes. The Lord repented of the evil which he brought to do unto his people. And, go, and it goes on. Now, it's easy for us to say, take a, you know, a, a flip through the Ten Commandments film and see all this and say, gee, weren't those people awful? Boy, they really were a stiff-necked people. And obviously what I'm leading up to is there go you and I. We are no better. Take a look at Adam. How long did it take him to sin? Take a look at Noah, the ark, and all, whole, that whole routine. And he's shamed immediately thereafter. Uh, Nabab and Abihu, we'll see, uh, Leviticus 10, there, and so forth. And uh, Joshua, the conquest, they, they, they're right on the heels of the incredible Battle of Jericho. That awesome, incredible display of God's power where the stronghold of the seven nations they were conquering, the strongest were the Amorites, and their stronghold was Jericho, and they took it first. And they didn't do anything but keep their mouth shut and hold silence for seven days, except when they blew the trumpets on the seventh time of the seventh day, and the walls fell down. Incredible. Incredible display. The fear of it going all the way through the, the entire region. What was the next battle, AI? And what a pathetic scene that was, the book of Joshua. We go through the whole scripture, and again and again and again, it's always on the heels of a great victory that we have an abysmal failure. So what do we do about it? The answer is we don't do anything. It's interesting how the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us. Here is Israel absolutely without excuse. This isn't a question of faith of things they hadn't seen. They'd seen, right? The pillar of fire by day, or for fire by night and smoke by day and so forth, right? And they fail, right? What's their answer? A mediator. 
A mediator. What's our answer? A mediator. Notice what happens to Israel. Moses besought the Lord God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath burn against thy people? And he argues on their behalf. And he argues on the strength of God's own commitments. Not Israel's commitments. They blew theirs. All that you have said we will do. It didn't look like it. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What's their first act? To make another god before them. I haven't analyzed it. I suspect you might have. You could probably argue that every one of the Ten Commandments was, was violated that the first chance they got. Coveting, adultery, making it false gods, graven images, you name it. It's all one in vain, taking his name in vain. You could probably go through the list and find them all here. And what's the answer? The mediator. And the basis of God's faithfulness, not Israel's, God's faithfulness. Remember, Abram, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou didn't swear by thine own self. And says to them, I will multiply. He reminds them of the promises he made. And God agrees and repents, changes his, his, his posture. And I think that's exactly the model that God would have us recognize tonight. As uh, we, you know, we have these Monday night Bible studies, that's great. Summer's coming, change your routine. Various ones of us are going to get in various kinds of trouble. And that kind of trouble is, is, is not out of reach of our mediator, the man Christ Jesus, whoever liveth to make intercession for you and I. And I, I, I've seen a list of virtually a hundred ways that Moses was a type of Christ. Just like Joseph, there's a, we, in the Genesis study, we, did, we, we enumerated, what, a uh, hundred ways that Joseph was a type of Christ. I've seen an equivalent list of Moses in the same way, being chosen as a deliverer and so forth. And one of the ways is here he, is his role of intercession on behalf of his people before the Lord. I would, uh, uh, in fact, that might be a, a, an excellent way for us to just tie off the book of Exodus is to recognize it is a book of instruction on the issue of redemption. You and I are in utter need for redemption. There is nothing we contribute to the price of our ransom. The book of Exodus is a book of redemption, and it is here ordained by God himself as a means of communicating his redemption of you and I. And what he would have us understand, I think, is that redemption is 100% his work. It is absolutely complete on his part. We simply have to avail ourselves of it. And we do so by a mediator, the man Christ Jesus. I think that, that thought might be a good thought to close on, and also this idea of standing outside the outer court, beholding his righteousness. Maybe we can see in the badger skins, the dark covering, and uh, this, the building which has no form nor comeliness, no beauty that we should desire it. But it's only by virtue of the sacrifice at the brazen altar, the washing at the laver, that we can enter into the place of fellowship, where we're illuminated by the menorah or the, the lampstands, partake of the, show, the, the, the bread of life, and uh, behold the Holy of Holies.